Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Dr. Phil Radke, a faculty member in Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation at Virginia Tech. And we're gonna be learning about making charcoal. So how did you get into making charcoal? What interests you about it? Well, I like the part about charcoal that it's a forest product, and also that it's something that can be done on a really small scale. Um, especially with like a portable type setup. And the other thing I really like about it is how it's actually a way to store carbon from wood that might otherwise be wasted. It could be used as a soil amendment, it could be used as something that we use you know, for cooking. And I've also worked with some other staff from the state of Virginia who have been showing landowners and forest operators around the state some of the different ways that they can use the what otherwise might be waste wood for um, making products like charcoal. All right, so Phil, what exactly is charcoal? Because I think a lot of people, uh, up until recently myself included, are only familiar with these kinds of briquettes that are very common in stores. But what we're making here today is actually quite different, right? So what are these different types of charcoal and, and what are we gonna be doing? Okay, well, yeah, that's a good question because people do know about these briquettes and these are manufactured in a process that is uh, similar to what we've been doing with our kilns and retort is that they start out with a product like wood or it could be even straw. It could be any kind of organic material and then they carbonize it by the same process where they get it real hot but with lack of oxygen and it turns black and it's very fragile when it comes out of the kiln like that it can crush up really easily and they basically will crush that into a powder and then add a few uh, other ingredients like maybe wax or kerosene something to make it burn better and sometimes they'll even put in binders like cornstarch to just make it stick together and that's how they get that characteristic shape so that's what the briquettes are they're made at a pretty large factory. Where um, the lump charcoal comes in, it's more of a raw process, uh, less processed material, but it's basically the same idea. You start out with your organic material like wood and carbonizing it through that process of getting it real hot without uh, any air or without much air. And people seem to like it in this raw lump form. And the idea there is that you can see the different kinds of lumps from this Royal Oak brand. This looks to me like it might have come from wood that was sawed, but left over from the scraps in a sawmill, something like that. But it's clearly charcoal, uh, same exact material as what's here. The difference with what we made is since it was basically small little twigs and limbs, it's still kind of got the round shape and you can definitely tell that this was a piece of wood. The reason that people like the lump charcoal is it has different properties when you cook with it. It's much hotter so you can really sear your vegetables or your steak or your seafood, whatever you're grilling. But it also is really responsive to uh, changes in the air. So you can make your fire go much lower or you can speed it up if you want to just by opening the vents in the air. The, the contents though of this is almost 100% nothing but pure carbon. Uh, there's very little other impurities in this and all that would be is whatever is left that remains as ash. So that might be some kind of minerals, but just trace amounts. Less than 1% of this is anything but, but just uh, carbon. And that's where the biochar comes in, even though we don't have the biochar product laid out here. We'll look at that in a minute is that that is also basically 100% carbon. But it's a lower quality, smaller pieces product, right? And plus we got it wet when we put it out, so it's not really designed for being used for cooking. Right, right, people use that as a soil amendment. You were saying that the science on that is kind of still out. And they're not mm -hmm. really sure that it, it works as a, very well as a soil amendment. But there are people that, that swear by it. And I, think, I, I think where it largely is used is in like greenhouse uh, mm. potting soils and horticultural potting soils. Mm -hmm. That does seem to have a pretty well established use. And you source your wood here on your farm, right? Yep, just from the woods, usually part of uh, firewood that I use for heating 
the house or right. having a fire on a weekend. We'll go up and take a look at that next. All right, so you were saying that there was a harvest back here in the woods in 2009, and some of the trees that were left were damaged by the logging equipment. Yes, exactly. It was before I owned this place, before my wife and I owned it, and uh, you could see these are healing, but the, they're damaged to the point where any wood that you get out of here is going to be affected, probably at least up you know, eight or ten feet. You know, because the, they're so hollow now um, from the damage, and that'll probably just get worse, they're pretty good candidates for trees to be called out of here to be using for firewood or, or anything else. And then there'll be more resources for the ones that are left behind. So this is a place where a couple of trees I cut down last winter to make firewood for next winter. And these happen to be a couple of oaks. So the tops here and all these branches and twigs and limbs will be, you know, just something that I have to either leave here in the woods or it's easy enough for me to cut them off anyway and I'll pile them up and I could either bring the kiln out here, the retort, or bring these over to where the garage is and then burn, the, burn them in the kiln or turn them into charcoal in the kiln maybe in the fall. Uh, they're already starting to dry out pretty well, so it probably would be ready to make charcoal out of them even just today if I had them all cut and moved to the place where, where it's convenient for me to work with them. The Kantiki kiln, which is an open kiln, and uh, we've dug a small hole for the base of it, and then um, Phil is filling in with dirt to stabilize it and insulate it. You can see it's just basically, it's just a cone. And it should have sloping sides. It could be a rectangle with sloping sides, that would work too. The retort kiln is a two-part kiln. It has this outer area where uh, fire is made, well-ventilated, roaring fire to heat the inner compartment, which is what holds the wood that actually becomes charcoal in that oxygen-limited environment. I fill in this bottom part, and then there's fire brick that goes on top of it. This perlite doesn't burn, it's basically just a mineral, a rock sort of, but a very, very light one. And then by putting fire brick on top of it, I get a better surface for having the, having the retort uh, fired up. All right, we can load. This is the inner chamber of the retort kiln, all loaded up with wood. We crammed as much in there as we could, and I guess that's important, right? You want to put as much in there as you can? Yeah, because the more you get in, the more you get out. Yeah. And this is mostly cherry, but a little bit of oak. Setting the lid on. And we're bolting the lid down to keep air from getting in. And then right over on this side, you can take a look. These, these holes here, I purposely put in the kiln so that gases can come out. So here's that canister, that inner compartment inside of the outer component of the retort kiln.
And this is just some white pine we're loading in here. This is not the wood that's going to be made into charcoal. The wood in the inner compartment is going to be made into charcoal. This is just providing the heat for that process. So here we're just uh, loading paper, cardboard, twigs, uh, scraps of wood into the Contiki kiln. And uh, we'll later be adding a lot of this brush and uh, then we'll be making some biochar. So we are getting both of our kilns um, set up so that we can light them both and have them both running at the same time. So we got our first sort of batch of stuff in the Contiki. We're gonna let that burn down for a little while and then do another layer. Meanwhile, over at the retort, it's thrown off a lot of heat. Well, you can see that oil that I used to start the fire is burning a little black. Yeah, but that'll burn off soon. Won't be any of that left much longer. With this style of kiln, the idea is that the, the wood will burn down and kind of cover up the charcoal pieces that are underneath the underneath it. So we're kind of making it in layers. A little bit of ash will fall down on top of whatever charcoal's in the bottom and then we'll throw a new batch of twigs in here and that'll basically really get fired up and then those pieces will fall down and sort of cover each other up and it'll slowly build up until it's filled up to about maybe about to here which will be when i'll flood it with water to put it all out so here we've added our second layer we might add a little bit more but we've got it raging again um, that piece there is about as big as a Contiki is going to be able to handle. So this, the wood that's inside the retort, it'll take a long time to just dry out the sticks that are in that vessel. And then once they're completely dry of water, then they'll actually start converting into the charcoal. So how long does it take uh, to make the charcoal? So we've got it, we've got it burning. And I guess that's making charcoal all along, right? Just yeah. very small amounts it's continuously. continuously. Piling up in the bottom. And so after several hours, it'll be you know, mm. two thirds full or three fourths full. You can get it as full as you really want to. And then that would probably take three to four hours. And in the retort, it's probably by the time you get all the water out of the inner vessel, the wood that's in the inner vessel, and then it uh, basically converts into charcoal the rest of the time. Probably um, I'll keep the fire going for about four and a half or five hours. So there's a little hole to vent the gases out of the inner chamber so that it doesn't build up pressure. And those gases are catching fire as they come out. Yeah, so now that we see that the vent is flaming, that means that pretty much most or all of the water is out of that wood that's in that inner chamber. And so from now on, everything is just converting the wood into charcoal. And the gases that are coming out are flammable, things like methane, and that adds more heat now to the whole process. So at this point, it's kind of self-sustaining. It'll just keep itself going until it's basically run its course. So probably about another hour and a half or two hours, we won't have to do anything else. You can see how much uh, the coals have built up in here now, and there's some ash in there as well. But just for purpose of demonstration, since I don't really have good size, uh, any more of those sticks left. We're just gonna put this out. So I'm use my garden well here. And it'll take quite a bit of water to put that out. I'll fill it up to the point where it's basically the, the charcoal is floating in the water. That way I know it's all completely soaked and saturated. If you wanted to use the charcoal for grilling or barbecue or anything like that, this 
step of getting it all wet is really kind of counterproductive. I guess there are, would be ways that you could dry it out, but uh, this is just intended to be a soil amendment. This biochar. So it's still giving off gas out of the little vent hole, mm -hmm. and you said that when that stops happening, we'll know that it's done. That's right. That everything that can can be converted to gas and burned off has been, and all that's left is the carbon. Yes, and I would also say that you notice it's really not jetting out like it was before. Yeah, it's going more up. So there's not as much pressure in there as there was. I think the production of that flammable gas is starting to slow down. I would say that's nearing the completion. And what I would normally do at this point, since there's still plenty of that pine in here to keep the heat going, I would just basically stop adding any more fuel to it. And I'll just let it burn down now until it goes out on its own. And I'll just make sure that there's no fire hazard here when I leave. and basically it'll be ready to open up in another 24 hours. So we'll come back in a day or two and open it up and get the charcoal out of the retort. Sounds good. So here is our completed Contiki uh, firing of our biochar. We will come back in a few days when the retort kiln has cooled down and take that out too. And take them both out then and look at them and compare them but right now we got this closed up fire is just about out in there so it's just a matter of letting that cool down and then we'll see what we got in a couple of days okay well it's friday now i'm back with phil and the saw has had a chance to cool down for a couple of days and so we'll open it up and see what we got Let's open it. Yeah. Oh. You can see how the volume reduces because the wood shrinks and some of it is lost in the reaction. And this is should all be just pure charcoal. It crumbles and falls apart, or you can break it apart. You can see the, the rings in there from the wood. The normal texture is it kind of snaps. Nice and shiny, people seem to like that. And that's how it looks when we open it up. What I would normally do is dump this into a metal can. It's been three days since we uh, burned the retort. Mm -hmm. And I checked the day after and it would have been cool enough even then to dump it. There wouldn't have been any hot mm -hmm. coals in here at all. But you don't want to open it too soon or else the whole thing will go up in flames. <laughs> Take this back. We'll see how it looks coming out. Okay. A little dusty, but other than that, I think it was all right. Yeah. Is it about half full? Yeah. Not quite, so it's somewhere around 20 gallons of charcoal would be probably 10 bushels or so something like that it's a it's a good quantity but uh, still just small scale for people who might want some for their own use or to share with friends and that well here's the contiki kiln where we made the biochar um, doesn't look much different than it did uh, when we left on tuesday but you can see it is the same stuff as charcoal is just pure carbon and a little wet, <laughs> a, little, a little soaked. Yeah. That's all we have for you today. Please join us in two weeks for another 15 minutes in the forest.